have your Bibles, please open it to the book of Acts, and we'll be in Acts chapter 2 this morning, Acts in the second chapter. And this morning, as we look at Acts chapter 2, we will see there in Acts chapter 2 a wonderful display of the power of God. Now, how many, you don't have to raise your hand, but think in your mind, how many want to see the power of God in their life? I think that most of us, if not all of us, would, if we're to take a poll, say, yeah, pastor, yes, I want to see God's power in my life. I want to see it displayed in, in my situations and in my circumstances and in my family and at my place of business and at my work and in my country. I want to see God's power in my church and my neighborhood uh, with my perhaps lost brother or unsaved son or daughter. I want to see God's power. I want to see God's power in my finances. I want to see God's power in the health situations. I want to see God's power. And in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see an account of a magnificent display of God's power. Do we believe that God can still work today? It's kind of a rhetorical question, is it not? I'm, I'm amongst friends here at church. Now, there are de definitely many places that if I were to ask that same question, it would not be met with a yes, but with a no. Those who don't believe in God and don't believe that God has a, any power or any specific power, that God cares or that he wants to work. Understand that as we talk about the power of God this morning, we are talking about the same God. There is not a different God that's found in Acts that's not found in Saginaw, Michigan. It's the same God. We're going to notice it's going to be the same power, the same gospel message that Jesus died on the cross, and by believing in him, you can find forgiveness of sins. It is the same message. The one they preached in Acts is the same we preach today. But sometimes God works differently and they're like there it is pastor i knew there was a catch i knew it was too good to be true i knew that god can work that way and he did and maybe he will again but but he probably won't for me we begin to be deceived in our minds and our lives when we begin to think begin to believe that god won't work his power in our life. He may work for this individual over here in this situation and this church over here and in this revival of the country and this spot, but, but he's probably not going to work in my life. And yet we have here in Acts a tremendous dis display, a magnificent display of the power of God. I want to this morning with the Lord's help look at what took place. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and then we'll look at Acts chapter 2 and see what God has for us on this January morning. Lord, we come to you needing your help this morning. Lord, I need your help as I speak and try to share from the Word of God your Word, Lord, some truths. Lord, your Spirit has to be among us and work in us. Lord, I pray that you'd make the Scripture to be clear and plain. Lord, I pray that as we spend some time around you and your word, that you would convict us, you would help us, you'd encourage us, but that all that would be done to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's an area in our heart or our life that does not please you, that does not reflect Christ correctly, that today that we would find forgiveness and, or that we would change that. Lord, I pray that you would do something here that is far beyond the time we spend together. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, has never trusted in you, that today they would believe in Jesus, call upon his name, and be saved. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter 2, it's one of the most, I would say, fascinating chapters in the Bible. There are so many elements of the story in Acts chapter 2 that we don't find in really any other space in the Word of God. That is why I said that sometimes God works differently. Now, we looked at these past Wednesday nights how God made us differently, and he's, but well, we know that, but sometimes God works differently. 
In some, he will choose to bless differently than others. It's just how he operates. But I want to notice some things from the power of God in Acts chapter 2 that I think will help you. And specifically, at the end of the sermon, we'll get down to how people reacted when they came to know Christ. And that reaction is imperative for you and I to learn from and to mimic. Now, notice in Acts chapter 2, we'll begin in verse number 1. We'll kind of work our way through. We will probably not read the entire chapter, but just some highlights so we can kind of get the background before we come to really the point that I want to make this morning. We find in Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord, they were of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to notice as we kind of work through this chapter that first of all, we're going to notice that the power of God came down upon these individuals. I noticed that, that they were where they were supposed to be, their obedience. As we left chapter 1 last week, we're reminded that Jesus had given them a specific task to be in Jerusalem and to wait for him. And that's exactly what they did. They followed the commandment of Christ, and they went back to Jerusalem after the angels. If you are here last week, the angels caught them staring into heaven. Some uncomfortable silence in church for a few moments. All right? And then they went to Jerusalem, and now they were waiting. Now, we know from how the feasts play out that they were there for around 10 days waiting in this room for Jesus, for the power of God, for the Holy Ghost to, to show up, for the commandment of Christ to be fulfilled. For 10 days, they were waiting for God to do something. Now, I imagine that was one of the longest 10 days in their life. Because the power of God is going to come, it does come, and they're sitting there waiting for it to come. And I'm just reminded that there are times in our life, and most times, that if we want to see God work, it takes patience. That's why the Bible says, And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And there are times that we're longing to see God work, that we have a promise from God that He's going to work, He's going to do something, but we forget to be still and know that I am God. We forget that the Bible says, It is good that a man both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And there are times that we wait a solid 15 seconds. And then we're like, okay, that did that part. That checked that off. Now let's do something. And here they are for 10 days. And the Lord could have waited 20 days or 30 days. He had already waited thousands of years before sending Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But sometimes we just have to be patient. I don't know about you, but... We don't live in a very patient society, and I don't always enjoy being patient. And I imagine, if you're honest, most of us don't enjoy being patient. Most of us don't go to a restaurant to learn patience. And when we learn patience at a restaurant, we think, I'm never coming back here again. They wouldn't even talk to me for 15 seconds. For five minutes or for ten minutes. Look at those people over there. They sat down after me and they got their food first. If we're not careful, we take that right into our approach with the Almighty. And we say, look at them. They got saved after me. And they got a blessing. They got the power of God. It is time sometimes that we have to wait. And here they were, just waiting for God to work. And God shows up. And God shows up. The Bible says he comes down and it sounds like a, a mighty wind. It filled the room. And, and there in Acts, it's like a, how the Holy Spirit came down, like little tongues of fire on their head. Now, why did God do that? I don't know, but that's how he chose to display his power during this time. God never does anything by accident, but God doesn't always explain why he's doing what he's doing. Remember that. Because in your life, God doesn't do things by accident, but he doesn't always explain why he's doing what he's doing in your life. And here they have these cloven tongues of fire that end up over their head. And then the power of God came, but it was evident. 
The Bible says in verse number 6, Now when this was noised abroad, so apparently people began to talk. Word got out that something was happening because when it was noised abroad, the multitude came together. People heard about this happening. They heard about what was going on with the disciples speaking. The Bible says in tongues, and I won't have time to talk about what that means, but it shows us clearly, or fully talk about it, that as the, the apostles spoke, people heard in their own language. They did not hear a blathering, all right, or just these unintelligible sounds. Everyone heard in the native language that they were born from. So the Bible says that clearly. Read the book of Acts later on. Actually, so they heard what was going on. But apparently word got out. And so people start to show up, as is apt to happen. We are curious people, are we not? What is going on over there? Look at those men. They are, they are doing something we've never seen before. The power of God. I want you to remember this. That... We can't miss the power of God. They didn't miss it. We can't miss it. But I'll tell you this. We can miss the power of God. Because as they're speaking, if you slide down the chapter, they're hearing these things speak. It's verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And verse number 12, they're all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They said, listen, that's not God. They're drunk. That's not God. All right, they've lost control. Now, what kind of explanation is that? They're hearing their own language, and we do realize that when someone loses control because of the consumption of alcohol, they don't begin to speak in different languages. That can be understood. This is obviously... Not just drunkenness. This is the power of God. But this is true. Some will never comprehend or understand what God is trying to do. Don't be, don't be discouraged when others discount what God is doing in your life. Don't be discouraged when others say, listen, that's not God. That's just coincidence. My friends, that's not coincidence. That's the power of prayer. That's not coincidence. That's the power of God who's at work in life and in a heart and in a, in, a, in a family. And something happened that day. Something awe-inspiring. Something moving. Something that was captivating. And what happened? God showed up. When God showed up, we're going to look at these verses, please, please. Uh, Beginning verse number 37. When God showed up, people were disturbed from their everyday activities. When God showed up, people were shook in their foundation of their religious beliefs. When God showed up, people were transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please, we find our text for this morning, beginning verse number 37 of Acts chapter 2. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and the brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then... They that were, they gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto the, them about 3,000 souls. That day, 3,000 people trusted in Jesus Christ. 3,000 people at one time came under such conviction, came under the power of God that they said, listen, I want to believe in Jesus Christ and they believed in 3,000 that day. That is a moving, is it not? We've been blessed here at First Baptist Church over the years to see many people make professions of faith where they profess Jesus Christ to be the one who died for their sins and believe in him and him alone for salvation. That's what the Bible says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and thou shalt be saved. The same way we're saved today is the same way they got saved back then. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And a lot of people like to put other words there. Well, you can pay for your sin if you're good. And I hope you're good, but being good has never paid for a single sin. You can pay for your sin if you join a church, and I hope you join a good Bible-preaching church. If you don't have a church family, we'd love to talk to you about joining First Baptist Church. But joining every church you ever come in contact with will not send anyone to heaven. You can still go to hell being a member of a thousand or a million churches. The only way to have sins paid for is by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 3,000 at that moment were transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder, have you ever been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him and him alone? All right, not him and what you're doing, not him and a church membership, not him and a baptism, but him and him alone for salvation. Jesus said this, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. No one who has ever come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins has been turned away. I was six years old at a Sunday school junior church class when I remember asking Jesus Christ to save me and forgive me from my sins. And you can ask, well, pastor, you're six years old. Were you sincere and serious? I believe I was. Because Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Can a child get saved? You better believe it. Can a mid-aged person get saved? You better believe it. Can an old person get saved? You better believe it. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I was six when I got saved. I trusted Jesus Christ, and that day, he transformed my life. Now, at six, I had not occasion yet to be part of the mafia. I had not yet occasion to become a drug dealer or live a life full of sin at six. I wasn't perfect, but I was not out murdering those folks around me. I was a normal six-year-old boy. But Jesus Christ, for a normal six-year-old boy, did no less of a work than he does for anyone else. And that day, 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus Christ, and God's power did a transformational work. Now, I want to point out how they responded. Because all that is really, really cool what God did, but I was captivated myself by how they responded. And I was convicted as I think you will be today as well. Because sometimes we get saved and we get calloused. We get comfortable. We see the power of God and maybe you're saved when you're young, maybe you're saved when you were older, but we forget. We lose touch with what God has done. And these people that day, they had some actions that I believe demonstrate what a close fellowship with God looks like. Look, please, beginning in verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So the first thing they did, they got baptized. They followed the Lord in obedience to his command. Baptism doesn't save us. Baptism merely lets everyone else know who I belong to. I often use the illustration, it's like my wedding ring. Now, a few weeks ago, I tossed a wedding ring on this stage. It was not my real wedding ring, and I will not throw this one. This is my real wedding ring. But this wedding ring, even if it's off my hand, I'm still married. Right? It's not like, now I am, now I'm not. Right? And if I doubt that, I could just check with my wife. Honey, am I still married? You better believe you are. Right? But this wedding ring signifies to everyone else that I'm married. That's what baptism does. That tells everyone else, that's where I belong. And understand that at this time in Jerusalem, these people were gathered for this feast, the Feast of Pentecost. And it was significant that they were baptized as a Christ follower. They were shedding their other religious background and identifying with Jesus Christ, and this was a big deal. It's different in America. People can get baptized without the fear of retribution, but not so, not so here in this time period. 
There are families, and still in places around the world, this will happen, where if someone believes in Jesus and then gets baptized, that their family will not speak to them, will disown them, will say, you are dead to me, my son, you are dead to me, daughter, and other places, they will kill them if they do this. Yet the first thing that these believers did, this 3,000, they got baptized. And it's like they said to everyone, you can pin it on my chest. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time for some believers to stop being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm talking about among your coworkers. We say, listen, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you one of those fanatics? You don't go to that First Baptist Church, do you? It's exactly where I go. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. It's time for some young people to quit being afraid of Jesus Christ and ashamed of Jesus Christ. Say, that's right. I will proudly bear his name. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. I want to give you this morning three uh, reactions uh, to the transforming power of the gospel. Number one, I noticed that they were diligent and fervent. They were diligent and fervent, or diligence and fervency. The Bible says that they continued steadfastly. They were diligent and fervent and hungry to know God and to know his ways. They wanted the apostles' doctrine. They wanted to learn more about this Jesus Christ. They wanted to know how to live as a Christian. This is the opposite of weak Christianity. This is the opposite of dead Christianity. This is the opposite of convenient Christianity. This is the opposite of itchy ears Christianity. These are Christians who are serious about their faith. I just have to think it's about time we became serious about our faith. And quit playing around with the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Quit playing around with just getting to know God and some of his ways. It's about time we got serious about his word. This day, 3,000 individuals got serious. In fact, they got so serious that others noticed and were bothered by it. Great fear. That's in verse I think it's verse 43. Great fear came upon every soul. Others were bothered by how serious they were. When was the last time someone was bothered because you're a Christian, a serious Christian? Our friends, if we're honest, there are many Christians who are saved, but they're weak. It's convenient. It's shallow. Sure, I understand you're here on a Sunday morning, and I appreciate that. But understand that coming to church on a Sunday morning is not the mark of deep Christianity. All right, walking with God every day, being serious, being steadfast, continuing steadfastly in the Word, learning about Jesus Christ. Time to be serious. It's time to set aside. In fact, the great author A.W. Tozer said this, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only things we can do ourselves. And God couldn't have used these apostles if they were not serious. Hmm. People would have us think that we should adapt our faith to accommodate others. Instead of one God, believe in many gods. Rather than believe in creation, believe in a modified view. But Jesus does not call us to adapt to our faith. He calls us to follow him. You see, their strong faith created the foundation for many to be martyrs for the cause of Christ. Their strong faith created the foundation for many. Throughout the book of Acts, you'll find that many Christians, as you read history, they were persecuted And many lost their life for the cause of Christ. You know why? They had real faith and a real foundation. And their strong faith created the foundation for many to be martyred for the cause of Christ. Our weakness, our weakness creates a foundation for many of us 
to be meaningless for the cross of Christ. Why don't we see God work? Why don't we see his power displayed? It's not because God's power is any different. It's not because God's desire is any different. It's because our weakness, our haphazard attitude, our laziness, our disregard for the things of God, our placing Christianity only where it's convenient and Christ only where it's convenient means it will be basically meaningless for the cause of Christ. And they were diligent and they were fervent. But notice it didn't stop there. Please continue to Scripture in verse number 44. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, verses 44 and 45 is an interesting observation. There are those that would try to take this and then say, well, this is the way that a, a church is supposed to operate. All right, that, that everyone at church ought to sell everything they have, and then we all live the same way. All right, now this is what happened in Acts. I want to just touch it just, a, just for a second. All right, because there's a lesson here, but the lesson is not that this is the way to do it. There's a principle there I want you to get. Understand that this was the method that God would have told us in Corinthians when Paul's talking to the church of Corinth, hey, sell everything you have and give each other, but he doesn't say that. He says, listen, if you have meat at home, then eat at home. He doesn't say, listen, if you have extra meat, just sell it and share it. He doesn't say it in Galatians. He doesn't say it in Corinthians. He doesn't say it in Timothy. He doesn't say it in Titus. He talks about living. He doesn't tell the masters, all right, to, to stop being a master, an employer, and sell what they have and give to their Christian employees. He says, be a good employer. To those who work for someone else, he doesn't say, listen, you need to quit and be the same. He goes, listen, no, you be a good employee. All right, so he could have repeated this, but he didn't. This was just what happened there. But I want you to notice the principles, what they did, that is still true today. Principles of stewardship and selflessness. Now, we're in the Stewardship Month campaign right now. Stewardship, doing what God wants with what I have. And here, how they enacted that is they sold what they had and just shared it around. Now, that's what God had for them. He does not repeat that anywhere else in the New Testament. But I'll tell you this. Letting God do what he wants to do with what you have is important. Absolutely important. Pastor Olette, who spoke this morning in our Sunday school, and if you missed it, you missed a great lesson. He's going to preach tonight at our evening service, so come back for that one. It's going to be great. He reminded us about stewardship. He said this, it's stewardship, my stewardship is a testimony. It can be good or it can be bad. But my stewardship is a testimony. God has blessed us, every single one of us. I read a story about uh, this preacher, old story. And this preacher would often go to church, and there's a young boy at the church that would come there early in the morning. And the preacher would always get a donut on the way to church. And when he came to the church, this young boy, who was not a son, would run up, and the preacher would split half of his donut with this young boy. And every Sunday morning, this young boy would get half of the preacher's donut. Well, as the story would go, one Sunday morning, as the boy came in, he had a bag of Cheerios. And so the preacher, just being friendly and kind, said to the boy, Hey, would you share some of your Cheerios with me? And so the boy took out one Cheerio, broke it in half, and gave half to the preacher. Now, isn't that what we often do with God? He gives us so much, and we can't even give him back a whole Cheerio. We're like, God asks for 10%, and so we carefully just crack that 10% right there. And if we make $843.15, then we make sure we have uh, $84 all right, right there for Jesus Christ. All right, there's your 10%. I'm going to break that to right in half. They have stewardship, and they have selflessness. They understood it's not about me, it's about others. A willingness to help others and a willingness to loosely hold what I have. You ever notice how those who complain usually don't want to give away what they have, they want to give away what you have? You ever notice that? 
Well, I, th I think, Pastor, we should sell everything we have. So, so you should sell what you have. Are you going to sell what you have? No, 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 you sell what you have. Those who complain usually want you to give away what you have, but they don't want to give away what they have. But the right response is proper stewardship and selflessness. And one more thing we notice here from this passage, please, in verse number 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and a singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We notice the, the third attribute they carried around. It was unity and worship. Notice that Satan seeks to divide. God seeks to unify. Satan wants to divide. He wants to divide husband from wife and dad from, from son, church member from friend and, and church. Listen, Satan wants to divide. If there's division here, that's not from God. Throughout the New Testament, we find this concept. We have one God, one Savior, one Spirit, one body. God wants us to be unified. Satan wants us to be divided. They continued with singleness of heart. They didn't have the issues that sometimes we face. They weren't worried about who was not smiling at them or shaking their hand. They weren't cross at a fellow Christian. They were having a singleness of heart and praising God. They were just worshiping. I would have loved to hear them praise God that day. It would have been authentic. It would have been real. We come to church, First Baptist Church, and we have some music that, that plays. I love the fact that you sing well, but we don't always sing well. Isn't that true? Yeah. Collectively, corporately, and individually. There are times we come to church, we come to praise, and our heart may be heavy. Our mind it may be bothered. You ever come to church bothered? I have before. I'm praying like, Lord, you got to help me because right now I'm bothered in my spirit. Sometimes we know why and sometimes we don't know why. You ever just wake up bothered? You're like, I just don't, like, this is not going to be a good day today. I ought to climb back in bed and wait and try out tomorrow. Here they had just worship. They had true worship. and They were just praising God. And notice what happened when, when these things took place, when they were diligent and fervent when they had proper stewardship and they were selfless, when they had unity and they worshiped, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They got to see the power of God every single day. God still wants to work, my friend. God still wants to touch lives in Saginaw and in Birch Run and in Frankenmuth and in Bridgeport in the Saginaw Township, and all the surrounding communities. God wants to work, but he's going to work through believers who are serious, who are not weak in their faith, but strong in their faith toward Jesus Christ. He's going to work through those who have proper stewardship and are selfless, and he'll work through those who are unified and who will worship him. You see, there is still transformational power available today. Still is. God that worked in Acts chapter 2 wants to work this morning. But if he's not working, I would submit it's often because we hinder him. Story told, citizens in Austria, they didn't know what to do. Napoleon's army was attacking. Napoleon's army arrived. And the citizens of Austria, they could see the soldiers on the hilltops. They had no defense. They had no battle plan. A small group of believers, of Christians, gathered at the church. It was Easter morning. They gathered there in a, in a conundrum, perplexed, in fear, wondering if this was to be their last day. The pastor stood up that Sunday morning, Easter morning, with Napoleon's army 
outside the small town in Austria, just poised to overrun the city. The pastor said this this morning, that morning. He said, as this is the day of our Lord's resurrection, and we've been counting on our own strength, and apparently that has failed. Let us just ring the bells and have church as usual. So that's what they did. The young bellboy clung to the rope and rang those bells as if his life depended upon it. And those bells pealed across the countryside as they worshiped and began that service that Easter morning, praising God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, they couldn't have known. Well, they didn't know. Was that Napoleon and his army, as the story goes, also heard the peal of the bells. And the peal of the bells caught them off guard. It caught them by surprise. It came out of nowhere, and apparently, as the story goes, because of the suddenness of the peal of the bells, the only conclusion that they could arrive at was not that this church was meeting for worship and was unified and was fervently worshiping. The only conclusion that they could come up with was that the whole Austrian army had arrived at night and was about to attack. Napoleon's army broke camp before the service was ended and left. I don't know how God will work in your life. I don't know how he will show up, but I know he wants to. I know that when he shows up, he wants to find that we are diligent and fervent, not weak and soft and convenient. He wants to find us being stewards of what he's given to us and selfless. He wants to find us unified and worshiping. And when we find it like that, the Lord will do his part, and he'll add his church. Maybe the reason you haven't seen the power of God is you're not in that place. So come back to it and see what God will do.